You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Morning, Stern. Gonna be a cold one. Oh, yeah. Ice on the wings all day. You got your long johns on? You bet. I don't believe it. What? Where'd you get the fancy hat? Not this. My wife bought it for me. Fur line and everything. Pretty nice, eh? Keep your brain from freezing. Yeah, you wish you had one. Nah, I already got a brain. Very funny. Flight 107 now on approach. Landing in approximately 10 minutes. Flight 107 arriving on schedule at gate 2. Time to go to work. As soon as I get me some coffee. Stern. Yeah? You and Ross get out there. Ah, uh, we're going, boss. On the airfield. Now. What's the big rush? Flight 107. What about it? On the radar. Repeat, will ya? You're breaking up. Lost radio contact. Pilot's not responding. Does he mean 107? Coming in by the seat of his pants. Get moving. On the double. We roger that. Let's do it. Lost radio contact, huh? No sweat. Pilot knows the flight plan. Unless they're playing poker up there. Here she comes. Lined up perfect. Wait a minute. That's not 107. It's gotta be. Yeah, but she looks different. Different how? Smaller, me. Yeah, right. Wipe your glasses. Get 23 off the runway. Keep it clear. Stern, walk her back to the gate. You got it. Uh oh, there ain't time. 107's dropping fast. Well, get out there. Signal her in. God, it's a, a prop plane. Is that a DC 3? Mr. Stern is correct. What is about to touch down is a DC 3. Despite the loss of radio contact, not an eventful arrival, which is no surprise. Most airplanes take off and land as per schedule. Very seldom do they crash. But all airplanes can be counted on to do one or the other. It is only on rare occasions that this workhorse hasn't reached its destination at the appointed time. Others like it have flown millions of miles with millions of satisfied passengers. We offer a rather detailed introduction because this DC-3 doesn't belong here. It is an anachronism. You see, DC-3s ceased operating as commercial passenger carriers a number of years ago to be replaced by more modern designs with jet engines. So where did this ancient example come from? It is an enigma, a seven-ton puzzle made out of aluminum and steel and a few thousand component parts, none of which add up to a satisfactory answer. In just a moment, we're going to give you 90% of the jigsaw you and the Federal Aviation Agency will assume the problem of finding the missing pieces and putting them all together. This we offer as a tantalizing brain teaser, a little extracurricular diversion flown in directly from the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, The Arrival, starring Blair Underwood with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Flight 51, you are not cleared for landing. Repeat, not cleared for landing. Low on fuel, please advise. Transies 13, maintain holding pattern, await further instructions. What's going on down there? Clearance to land temporarily denied. Tower, I see an aircraft off starboard at 3,000 feet. Can you identify? Stay above it. Continue circling. I have 250 passengers on board. Will someone please tell me what is going on? Flight 107's on approach. Here it is on the screen. So? You have her flight plan? You've lost radio contact. She's not responding. Then give her plenty of room. Keep scanning all frequencies. I've done that, sir. The pilot can't hear us. Or he's passed out. Do you have a visual? Not yet. She's dropping fast. Lined up and coming in. She almost clipped a 737. And he says... Well? He says it's not a trans-east plane. What? The pilot says it's... Look out the window. 
Let me see what kind of... That's not Flight 107. What the? Must be from an air show. I don't believe it. Neither do I. What the heck is that? That son is a DC-3. Here it comes. He's gonna make it. Oh, he better. He's down. Perfect three points. Tell the trucks to back off. We don't need them. Look at that. Right on the mark. Get the ramp in place. We don't have a ramp to fit that. Use the ladder. Over here. I got it. Hold it steady. Right. Okay, you can open up. What are they doing in there? I better give them a hand. Watch your step. Hey, inside, let's go. How about it? You need a can opener? Hey, are they asleep or what? Must be dead. Hello, DC-3. Use the manual latch. It's a real antique. That's no antique. It's as shiny as the day it was made. Let me off this cart. Huh? I don't see any crew, sir. Ross, get the cargo hold open. Right. Go on in, Stern. Yes, sir. Well? Well, Mr. Cousins. Speak up. How many passengers do we have in this crate? Uh... None, sir. What are you saying? What do we have? That's just it, sir. We don't have anything. Hey, Cousins. You better come over here. What's the matter? There's no baggage in the hold. Not so much as a piece of paper. I'm calling Bankston. Somebody get the airport police. Whatever's going on... Stern, how are the crew? I... couldn't say, sir. Talk sense, man. Nothing. No passengers. No pilot. No co-pilot. The entire plane is... absolutely empty. Mr. Bingston, I'll take over. All right, gentlemen, will you knock it off, please? This is Mr. Sheckley from the Federal Aviation Agency. He'll continue the questioning. Is Malloy here yet? On his way, sir. Then we'll have to go ahead without him. The rest of you, do me a favor and just stick to the facts. It's all yours. Thank you, Mr. Bingston. First of all, I'd like to say that this is not a formal hearing. It's more the nature of a preliminary meeting. As your operations chief has noted, we're here to unearth as many facts as we can so that we'll know where we stand. And you can save us all a lot of time if you'd avoid any personal hypotheses you may have formed. That way we can keep the air clear and not clutter it up with six dozen theories. <laughs> you see, theories happen to be my business. In 20-odd years with the FAA, I've got a pretty good record of putting together jigsaw puzzles. Maybe not all of them as off the wall as this one, but... I'd lay my batting average on the line any day of the week, so don't worry. Whatever the answer is, I'll find it. Now, let's get down to business. Which one of you is, uh, Cousins? Uh, here, sir. You were in charge this morning? Yes, sir. And you were on duty when Flight 107 arrived? Flight 107? Out of Buffalo. That was the scheduled landing for that time, wasn't it? Yes, sir, but Flight 107's supposed to be an L-1011. Just answer the man's questions, cousins. I'm trying, Mr. Bankston. Now, you were on duty? I was, yes. Anything you observed about the landing that was abnormal? No, sir. She did it by the book, as far as I could tell. Who signaled her in? Ross, over there. Mr. Ross? Uh, yeah? Did you notice anything out of the ordinary? Uh, no, sir. Uh, she came in right on the button, followed my signal, stopped on the mark, and then shot off her engines. Did you see who was piloting? Uh, no, sir, I didn't. Uh, that is, I don't remember seeing them. Couldn't you see through the cockpit windows? Well, normally when I flag a plane in, my eye's on her mark and uh, any other aircraft on either side. I don't remember actually looking into the windows at all. Uh, not then, anyway. You weren't on the field alone, were you? Uh, no, sir. Uh, Mr. Stern was working with me. You concur, Mr. Stern, uh, about the landing? Sure do. Nothing out of the ordinary that I could see. Thank you. Mr. Bingston, is this the manifest? That looks like it. And this, is this the flight plan? Yes, it appears to be. Did the dispatcher from Buffalo get here? Uh, yes, sir. Good. Good. You want to take a look at this? Yes, that's the flight plan. You saw the pilot sign this? I was at his elbow, sir, this morning at 11.12 a.m. 
pilot was uh, Captain William J. Slocum. That's right. And the co-pilot, uh, John O'Brien. That was the first officer's name? Yes, sir. You knew both of them? Yes. Did you see them board the aircraft? Well, uh, not exactly, sir. I saw them leave the dispatch office and head toward the field. But to the best of your knowledge, they were the crew of Flight 107 when it took off from Buffalo at 11.30 this morning? To the best of my knowledge, but it wasn't a DC-3, that's for sure. Slocum O'Brien. They're good pilots, both of them. Sober, reliable, and... I'm not casting any stones, Mr. Bingston. It's just that the names seem familiar. I'm, just, I'm not sure from where. It'll come to me. Now, who was on duty in the control tower? That's me, sir. You had radio communication during the approach? Yes, sir. And then for the landing? She contacted us over the outer marker, and I gave her clearance. Now, the way I figure it... Just answer. Don't offer. Well, I was just going to say that when the aircraft checked in over Fulton... Was that a normal checkpoint? Yes, sir. And she checked in right on the money. But the transmission sounded a little funny. As a matter of fact, I remember asking for a repeat of position. I couldn't raise him, though. I see. And did you hear from him again? Over the next checkpoint, 20 minutes later... Fulton, you say. Fulton. <laughs> Mr. Cousins, you were the first one at the door, right? No, sir. By the time I got there, Stern was pounding on it. Uh, there was no answer. And Ross had already opened the baggage compartment? I waited for Cousins. Then I opened her up and I told him that the ship didn't have any baggage. How about when she loaded up in Buffalo? What was she carrying then? You got a list there. I know what I've got. I'm asking you, what baggage was in the aircraft? When she took off, there were 21 pieces of luggage, five sacks of mail, five other crates of equipment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that checks. Sorry I'm late. Malloy, glad you could make it. Well, I guess that'll do for now. If I have any more questions, I'll let you know. And I'll see some of you later when I examine the plane. Thank you for coming. All right, man, back to work. If you're off shift, make sure you can be reached. And don't talk to the press. Is that clear? Not a word. Who's this? I'd like you to meet Paul Malloy. He heads up our public relations. Public relations, huh? Well, I can't help but wonder. How much public and what kind of relations are you poor guys going to have after this one? I'll handle it as well as I can under the circumstances. Frankly, I haven't decided what to tell the public yet. I'll tell you something. Relax. I've got 22 years in the saddle, and I haven't been licked yet. Sometimes the investigation takes a while. A couple of tons of smashed up metal spread over 50 square miles of countryside, and all it turns out to be is a misplaced air scoop, or uh, maybe a loose bolt in an elevator hinge, or once in a blue moon, it's a pilot who got sick. But it's always something, and that something eventually shows up. You're talking about crashed aircraft. We're talking about a disappearing act here. Don't forget a switched plane. Like some kind of Las Vegas magic act. Look, you don't have to tell me that. I don't know what the wire services are going to make of it, but I've got to tell them something. And I hope you can give me a place to start. Because none of this could have happened. An airliner takes off with a full crew and 13 passengers. At least some kind of airliner does. And it lands an hour later. With nobody. This is simply not within the realm of possibility. Mr. Malloy, I have to hand it to you. You're dead right. But the truth is, it's happened. I deal in facts, not probabilities. But it can't have happened. First of all, an aircraft couldn't land that perfectly with nobody at the controls. Secondly, a plane load of people doesn't just disappear in midair. There must be... There has to be an explanation. A legitimate, valid, rational explanation. I couldn't agree more. And now, I think it's time we go over to the hangar. I'd like to have a look at this magic plane firsthand. Yeah, that should do it. Thanks for showing me around, Mr. Cousins. Uh, before you go, Mr. Ross here wants to tell you what he thinks happened. I don't think that's necessary. No, I'd like to hear it. He was on the scene. What do you have to say, Mr. Ross? Well, the way I see it, there's only one explanation. Just for a gag, these 13 people had parachutes. They kept them in the baggage compartment. That's why there wasn't any luggage. And someplace between here and Buffalo, they jumped out like D.B. Sweeney. That's brilliant. And what happened to the pilots, Mr. Ross? I suppose that part of it's elementary. Well, maybe, uh, 
Maybe they hid in the restroom, then sneaked out of the plane after we left. Oh, please. You're imaginative, Mr. Ross. I'll give you that. What if? What if what, Stern? Eh, nothing. Truth is, it beats me. I'll tell you something else, though. I still feel spooked. Standing here, I, I felt spooked even worse when I was inside. Just a whole bunch of empty blue seats staring at me. Look, boys, we've been theorizing for six solid hours. Now, I'm just a simple-minded vice president in charge of a medium-sized airport. I've got a passel of newsmen hounding me to death, wanting to know what kind of operation we're running up here. Tell them to keep their shirts on. That's what you should be telling them. Or a reasonable facsimile of an explanation. That's what I hired you for, Malloy. Then you better hire me another head and a couple of sets of arms, because I haven't been off the phone all day. I've had every news service, television network, and even a couple of professional mind readers trying to find out what's the great big mystery we're keeping under wraps. You know how long I can sit on this, Bankston? Maybe another 15 minutes. Then it's going to break open with a bang, and we're going to stand here with rotten eggs all over our faces while Mr. Sheckley's FAA takes our license away from us. Incompetence, mental instability, you name it, and you can have it. This passenger manifest... What about it? You've checked out every name? I have not. That's all I need now, to have a small army of relatives from upstate New York clutching at my lapels and asking for a definitive statement as to where their loved ones are. How many calls have you had? None, so far. You mean to say you haven't had any inquiries yet? Not a single one? It is strange, isn't it? Not a single inquiry from the families. The plane only arrived six hours ago. Maybe they haven't had time to miss their... But I'm kidding myself. Of course some of them would have made an inquiry by now. Those who weren't already waiting at the gate. Mm, there goes that old feeling. What feeling? The one I get when I'm on to something. Trouble is, I don't quite know what it means yet. The names on this passenger manifest, they're, uh, they're familiar. You've seen them before? I'm not sure. Let me have another look at the inside of this plane. Sure, but why? I want to check it out. One more time. Uh, watch your step. That ladder's tricky. What's he expect to find in there that he didn't see before? Something along the lines of a clue, I would hope. Uh, this is a waste of time. We've got to issue some kind of statement before we become a laughing stock. Ross. Yeah? What was it you said? Oh, for the love of... Why don't we just bring in a psychic? You mean about the pilot's hiding out? No, no, something else. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you said you looked inside the plane when it landed and you saw blue... Seats. Uh, that was me. I was the first one in. Right. Mr. Stern, I just walked up the aisle and back again. They are blue. What kind of nonsense is this? An hour ago, when I first examined the interior of this aircraft, the seats were brown. Haven't we got enough trouble without you two starting an argument about interior decoration? Hey, wait a minute. Where is the serial number on this plane? On the wing, of course, just as it was the first time you looked. You see a number on the wing now? Of course I do. Read it off to me. N153802. You're sure? I think I can read numbers that large. Yeah. Can you read this? The notes I took when we got to the hangar. Take a look. N107793. Hmm. Now you must have copied it wrong. Mr. Stern. Yeah? You see a number painted on the tail? Sure do. Read it off to me. What? I said, read it off to me out loud. The number's on the tail. If you say so. N664753. What's this all about? What did I write down on my clipboard? Mr. Malloy, verify, please. Uh, N107793, the same as Bankston said. I don't see what... Care to read it again? What are you trying to prove? That we're going off our rockers now? Seeing different numbers? That's always where the numbers are on a DC-3. The wing and the tail. When I started in this business, there were quite a few of them still flying. The first one was built in 1935. December 17th, to be exact. The anniversary of the Wright brothers. There were hundreds made, and they kept flying for decades. I don't see what the A real workhorse, this plane. In the Second World War, more than 10,000 were ordered by the military. They called them C-47s. Eisenhower once said there were four inventions that won the war. The Jeep, the Bazooka, the A-bomb, and the C-47. A few are still operating. 
It's a design you can trust as solid as they come. All very enlightening. But if you don't mind, I have a press release to get out. Hold on, Mr. Malloy. You wouldn't want to miss this. What? Gentlemen, I believe I've finally come up with a theory that fits the facts. Uh, unfortunately, there's only one way I can prove or disprove it. Why, unfortunately? Do you have someone who knows how to start this plane? Certainly, any one of my mechanics, but I... Would you call him over? Now, Bingston. Miller! Sir? Get over here. I don't see what this... With any luck, we'll all see one way or another. I'm sorry to say that what I'm about to do places me in considerable jeopardy. I hope I'm right. If I'm not, please make sure my wife is notified, will you, Bingston? Mr. Miller? Yes? I want you to climb into the cockpit. Uh, sir? Then, on my signal, start one of the engines. If you say so. For what possible reason? I'll assume full responsibility. Now, everyone stand as far back as you can. If I'm right, you're about to see something you never imagined possible. And if you're wrong? Then you'll see something none of you will ever forget. Before you begin this experiment of yours, I think we deserve some sort of explanation. All right. Is everyone here familiar with DC-3s? Why, of course we are. It was the plane that made commercial air travel possible. Correct. And your mechanics, your personnel, they've all seen them, worked on them. Your point is? Just this. What do you know about the power of suggestion? What are you driving at, Mr. Sheckley? Suggestion on a large scale involving everyone here and on the airport staff. Now, call it mass hallucination, group hypnosis, whatever you want. But I think that's what we're dealing with now. I thought you deal only in facts. I do. Including facts, not in evidence. Look at the situation. An L-1011 takes off from Buffalo. Somewhere along the flight path, the aircraft loses radio contact. Now, maybe it goes down in an out-of-the-way area. We don't know yet. But you were expecting it to land here. And at the appointed time, someone sees or thinks... He sees a blip on the radar. And then, with everybody watching the sky, someone else thinks he spots a silver glint coming in. Only from his angle, it looks sort of like a DC-3. The next thing you know, he's spreading the word. Ah, there's your power of suggestion working full force. The bottom line is everyone has a little hypnosis performed on him without even knowing it. Why, that's absurd. I'm looking at the plane right now. We're standing next to it. But are we? Consider the alternative. A modern passenger plane with jet engines changes somehow in mid-flight. And when it lands, it's transformed into an old prop plane. That's impossible, wouldn't you agree? And now, everyone's told us it landed. And that it's supposed to be inside this hangar. That's what everyone says. Every one of us has a picture in his mind of a DC-3 as he knows it. Only, no two memories are identical. Hence, one of you says the seats are blue, another one says they're brown, and another one probably thinks they're red. I read off one number on the wing. Two other guys see two others. Do you understand what I'm saying? If I'm right, then this particular aircraft doesn't exist. It really isn't here at all. Hmm. Miller. Yeah? Fire up the starboard engine. Mr. Bingston. Go ahead. Mr. Sheckley seems to be in charge. Yes, sir. You're trying to tell us that this is an illusion? Well, I've got a news flash for you. It's as real as I am. You can feel it. You can touch it. In that case, one of two things will happen. Either I'm about to prove to you that you're wrong, or I'm wrong. Dead. Wrong. If this plane is a product of our collective imaginations, then so are the engines. And so are these propellers. If I stick my hand through them, Nothing is going to happen. But if my theory is for the birds and these props are real, then remember what I said, will you? Break it to my wife, Jenny. 
Ready? Wait, Sheckley. Let's talk this over. We can talk later. He can't be serious. Aren't you going to stop him? I can't give orders to the FAA. Rev it up. What's he gonna do? Put his hand in the propeller. Jiminy Christmas, is he nuts or what? Get those RPMs higher. I can't look. Good lord. He's going to stick his his entire arm and in, into the No! <laughs> You see, gentlemen, Whew. I believe I've proven my point. <laughs> you okay? Careful. Here, I'll help you down. Uh, I'm fine. Still got two hands. A little shaky, but they're both attached. How'd you do that? I, I don't get it. Where's the plane? Well, it's simple, really. A little melodramatic, perhaps, but it was just as I thought. The plane... Uh, the plane was a kind of projection all along from our imaginations, our, our subconscious minds. You might say we believed it into existence. I could have sworn that... Yes, you could have. And why not? You've seen DC-3s before. Plenty of them, but... So, when everybody told you one was here, you saw it. Clear as can be. We all did. Oh. <laughs> now, if you don't mind, I think I'd like some fresh air. What'd it feel like? Uh, like nothing at all, because that's what was there. Nothing. So you felt nothing, because you didn't expect to? Something like that. But you expected to see us, so you still can? Just like the world outside this hangar. That's plenty real for me. Well, it's reassuring to know that my airport still exists. Ah, uh, you don't need to stay with me, fellas. I can handle it from here. What are you going to write in your report? I'll think of something. I only hope it doesn't get me thrown into the booby hatch. We'll go back to my office and work out a statement. Mr. Cousins? Yes, sir? Take a walk through operations. Don't talk about what just happened. If anyone mentions a DC-3, laugh it off. Right. Deny, deny. Will do, sir. Good man. No, oh, I have a first-rate staff. You're referring to one man specifically? You're second in command. Uh, what's his name? I don't know who you mean. Ah, I have it here. Cousins. You spoke to Cousins? He was very cooperative. I'd like to make mention of him and... You can't have spoken to Cousins. I gave him the rest of the day off. No, oh, that man ahead of us. Where? Well, he must be out of the hangar by now. As, as for the other two, Ross and Stern, they witnessed my little demonstration. I, I wouldn't recommend they talk to the press... You'll debrief them, Malloy? Who? Uh, I guess they stayed behind with the man who started the engine. The engine? <laughs> How soon we forget. But that's for the best, I suppose. So, now you've seen our main hangar. Tell me, Mr. Sheckley, what brings you to our facility today? Just passing through, or is it an official visit? Y you may have the right idea. Uh, to put it out of our minds. But there is one small matter, the... FAA, if I can work out a version that jibes with Mr. Malloy's. And... Malloy, did you say? Well, he's right over... Where? The one who was walking next to you. I don't see anyone. What is this, some kind of disappearing act? Malloy from PR, I'm Sheckley, got it? And, and you, you're... Bingston. Bingston, where are you? May I help you? Where is Bingston? Mr. Bingston's in his office, but but you can't go in without... What? Bingston! What happened to you? What happened to everybody? And you would be... Don't give me that. Oh, yes. Sheckley, isn't it? From the FAA. I think I remember you. We've met before. Is this a gag? Have a seat. Is there a problem? Problem? Are you, are you, are you kidding? What minute there's a... A hangar full of men and an aircraft, and the next minute I prove that not only doesn't the aircraft exist, but... I, I don't follow. What doesn't exist? But... But that, uh, that all of the, the rest of it are... All of you... Are you sick, Sheckley? Or drunk? You don't look very good. Sit down, man. Where's Malloy? Still in his office, I presume. Then you'd better call him in here. He's got a few things to answer to, just like the rest of you. Uh, Kimberly... Should I call security? That won't be necessary. Ask Malloy to come to my office, will you? If he hasn't gone home for the night. Yes, sir. 
We've had a busy day here, Mr. Sheckley, but my PR man handled it admirably. The evening paper just arrived. Let me see that. Lovely Hollywood star Penny Jackson arrived from Buffalo this morning on tour to promote her latest film. What is this? Malloy coordinated everything. Photographers, reporters, quite a scene we had here. I was just on my way out. Who's this? Who, who am I? What, what is this? How could they have taken this picture? The flight from Buffalo this morning. How could they say it landed when... When what? You know this guy? Mr. Sheckley, this is Paul Malloy, our public relations man. I know who he is. What in God's name is going on here? Maybe you better tell us. What's so odd about a picture on the front page of the local paper? What's so odd? I, that has to be Flight 107. Bingston, didn't that flight arrive this morning with nobody on it? No crew? No passengers? No baggage? No, Mr. Sheckley. Flight 107 landed on schedule. You mean to stand there and tell me you are not missing an aircraft? That's exactly what he's telling you, mister. We're not missing Trans East 107 or any other flight. How could that be? Uh, you never missed Flight 107. That's right. Uh, at least not recently. You of all people should know that, Sheckley. Know what? You're confusing the two. I remember now. That's why you looked familiar to me when you walked in. You were the examiner on the other one. What other one? We've had one flight lost in some 20-odd years. Just one. Flight 107. Right. But, Mr. Sheckley, that must be 17, 18 years ago. Flight 107 out of Buffalo. Out of Buffalo. An old DC-3, but like I said, it was a long, long time ago. What's all this about? What happened to her? Lost in a fog and never found. We always figured she veered off course, ended up over the ocean, and went down. You never found her. Not a trace. And Mr. Sheckley here investigated the disappearance, but... That's one case he's never been able to close. Nobody has. It just sits in the record books as lost, presumed crashed. For reasons unknown. And it's never stopped eating at you. It still is. So you came back here today looking for an explanation, any explanation, so you could finally put it to rest. I've never been licked on a case. Never. We've always found the cause. Mr. Sheckley... Why don't you let someone drive you home? Never. We've always found the cause. Always, I tell you. Is he going to be all right? I honestly hope so. Flight 107, 13 people. Pilot William J. Slocum, co-pilot John O'Brien. I never forgot your names. What went wrong? I have to know, where did you go down? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you now? Where are you? Hey, Flight 107, why didn't you leave me a clue? Any clue at all? Why? Are you out there somewhere? You gotta be. You gotta be. For those in need of an explanation, there's always the obvious one. Simply that of a man with an Achilles heel. A mystery that once landed in his life and robbed him of his peace. A perpetually missing aircraft that disappeared with no clues, leaving an unanswered question in Mr. Sheckley's neatly ordered world. A heavy burden to carry through the years, made up of one part enigma and one part the knowledge of his own failure until it ultimately took the form of an illusion. At least, that's the clinical answer, the one they'll write on his case file as he goes off for a well-deserved rest. Or consider this. Maybe, just maybe, a plane did touch down, however briefly, before it disappeared again. A kind of airborne flying Dutchman. A ghost ship lost in a fog-shrouded night, on a flight that never ends. Take your pick. But the latter is more conducive to the rules and regulations of the Twilight Zone.
Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. The Arrival, starring Blair Underwood, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Christian Stolte, Craig Brawley, Jeff Lupiton, James Schneider, Derek Procell, Turk Muller, Kurt Nabig, Karen Olson, Carl Amari, Roger Wolski, and Vince Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. 